Hello friends out in Facebook land, all my Sweetwater friends and everyone else on Facebook world. Tonight we are getting ready to have a look at uh, Revelation chapter 19 and have some prayer time. Uh, we've been going through Revelation chapter 19 for a long, long time, and uh, or Revelation for a long time. Uh, but tonight we're trying to get into chapter 19 it's it's here, honey. It's it's not there. Yes, uh, and uh, chapter nineteen's big. So uh, you know we're we're looking forward to uh, seeing everything that's there. Uh, so it's uh, hey, there's there's uh, Giselle and Lynn Graber and uh, uh, I think uh, Jenny Hayes is in there somewhere and um, some girl named Rebecca Parrish Carlisle. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, so very good. We're, we're off to a good start. So we're going to, uh, wait for a few seconds. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, Jenny says, good job. Uh, if she knew how uh, much panic we were in the last few minutes, because it wouldn't go on when it was supposed to. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Jenny. Appreciate that. Uh, so what we're doing and, and you can, people, uh, have been calling in today saying, is it only on Facebook? Right now it is. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to uh, be videoing this also. Uh, hello to the uh, Jane and, and David and, and John. Good evening. Uh, but um, uh, we are uh, also taping this to be able to upload to YouTube hopefully by tomorrow. So, um, uh, so we look forward to, uh, uh, to seeing everybody there. And Lynn Graber, uh, uh, Marsha Marquina says hello to you. Uh, so... Um, uh, so it's, it is a small world. So looking forward to uh, getting a gr good group on here tonight and uh, uh, getting into uh, the book Revelation a little bit. So we're going to uh, wait another minute just to let some other folks uh, get in and, and, then, and then we'll get started. Uh, tonight what we're going to do when it comes to uh, the prayer time, uh, because I don't want to put uh, people's stuff out all over the world. Uh, we're just going to be using first names. Uh, the Lord, the Lord knows the last names, so we're just going to be using first names tonight. And uh, generally speaking, most of you who've, who've been in our uh, sessions the past uh, uh, few months will recognize the the names straight out, uh, so that you will uh, very quickly be able to uh, see whose names uh, are in there and, and know automatically who we're talking about. So, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, Billy Joe and Carol are here. Sandra's here from all the way over in beautiful Sumter County. Uh, so, uh, so let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer together, and then uh, we will uh, we'll get into it a little bit. Father, thank you for all my brothers and sisters who are here virtually with me tonight. Thank you that they're staying home and staying safe. Uh, it's a scary time. Uh, but, Lord, you have told us over and over and over again in your word, Fear not, for you are with us. And so, you know, Lord, we're going to be smart, but we're not going to be afraid. And we're going to stay in and we're going to uh, let this plague pass us by. And we're going to just trust you for uh, a good positive resolution to all of this. And so, Father, thank you for being with us tonight. And Lord, we just look forward to all that uh, we're going to learn tonight. And as we pray together, uh, how marvelous, Father, that... Uh, uh, wherever the World Wide Web can reach, you're already there. And we can be in dozens and dozens of different living rooms and kitchens and patios around the world. But you, Lord, are already there. And we're all tied together through the power of your Spirit. Thank you, Father, for being with us tonight and for all your goodness to us. Bless us, Lord, as we open your word and as we pray together. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so it's been a while since we've uh, been able to be together. Uh, so we're looking at uh, chapter 19. Uh, and to go back to chapter 18 um, and, and 17, uh, just as a reminder, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. The world is, is Rome. Rome is the world. And it fuels everything. And in one, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at just how the economy of Rome was driving the economies of countries all around the world. 
um, uh, from, from the, Spain to China. Uh, it was just absolutely amazing. They were trading with countries everywhere. They were getting spices from India. They were getting uh, spices from uh, Africa. Uh, they were getting um, uh, South Africa. They were getting uh, silk from China. And it was, it was very, very, very valuable. The silk was, uh, a pound of silk was worth a pound of gold. I mean, that's just how important all of it was. And so, uh, and yet through all of this uh, was the Christian church. And the church was um, uh, able to uh, uh, suffer through uh, so much pain, so much suffering. Uh, hey to Andy and hey to Kay, so excited y'all are here, that's cool. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the church was, was kind of the, the bad guy in the Roman story because by John's time, the world had changed since Paul's time. Paul had said, look, let's, uh, let's be good citizens. Let's pay our taxes. Let's pray for the emperor. Let's, uh, let's not worry about the, the power of Rome or or the, uh, the police of Rome, you know, the sword of Rome is only for, their, for those people who, uh, who break the law. Well, the world had changed by John's time. By John's time, the church was under severe persecution. Hundreds, maybe thousands upon thousands had died horribly. John himself was there on Patmos to basically starve to death and die a, a lonely, lonely uh, death. I mean, it was, it was a terrible, terrible time for the church. And the crunch of it was, uh, the emperor by John's time had truly become God. And so when you pay your taxes, you have to do so by declaring that the emperor is Lord. The emperor is Lord. Well, no, no Christian's going to say anything other than Jesus Christ is Lord. And so this was the problem that the church had. And it simply would not be willing to, to cave in and, and, and say that, that Caesar was more important than Christ, that he was Lord and not Jesus. And so to do that, to say, no, I'm not going to uh, say that Caesar is Lord, I'm not going to uh, deny my Christ, was tantamount to treason. And so this was the problem that, uh, that the church was facing. They were being arrested for being unpatriotic, for, for treason. They were, they were being put to death for insulting the emperor. And so, so this, is, this is where the church was. And by the time we come to chapter 17 and 18, John is seeing the future. He is seeing a future where Rome has fallen. Uh, and in the book of Revelation, he doesn't just call Rome out by name. It's, it's Babylon. You know, that's, that's the euphemism. Babylon has fallen. And, and the crash was terrible as, as uh, Revelation tells us that merchants and sailors and, and kings all lamented her, her death. And, and she was gone. And, and so the world was, was crushed. But the world was crushed. The world was crushed. Rome was crushed because of God's judgment on this, this horrific culture that put wealth and power above everything else, that was grinding everyone else under its feet. Jerusalem had fallen by this time. Uh, the great temple and everything in it had been utterly destroyed. Uh, Rome had absolutely no patience whatsoever for anyone who was willing to stand up to it and just ready to, to crush everyone. And so, John is looking ahead. He is, he is being shown things of the future, a day when Rome would fall. And, and, and so here comes, here comes the end by the time we get to, to chapter 19. And so in, at the beginning of chapter 19, uh, Rome has fallen. The, the great beast is, is, is on the run. And, and the lamb, the lamb comes from the throne. Uh, hello to Shelby, hello to Wendy, hello to Kay, glad you guys are here. Um, and so the red dragon, Satan, and his beast are in grave danger as the lamb comes out and there is the marriage of, of the lamb and the church. Uh, as, as Paul spoke about, as Christ spoke about the, the marriage of the, the bridegroom, Christ, and his bride, the church. And so here is what is happening. Here is what we come to now at the middle of Revelation chapter 11. 
So in verse 11, it says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And let me pause right here. I should have said this at the start. Uh, on our First Baptist Sweetwater website, which is fbsweetwater.org, fbsweetwater.org, you can go on the, the homepage of the website and uh, find the link that will allow you to download all the notes from tonight. It's just two pages and uh, shouldn't be uh, too much. Uh, the 19th chapter is, is pivotal. Here comes Christ. Here comes the conqueror. Here is the one who is, is ready to be able to set the world right. Hello, Andrea. It's good to see you too. So uh, as we come to this, this 11th verse, John sees heaven open and a white horse comes out and the rider on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war, wages war. Sweet tea. So comes now the conqueror. The, the marriage of, of the, the lamb and the church has happened. But now things are changing. We're getting a different view of the Jesus that we've seen throughout Scripture. This is not the, the Jesus meek and mild that the poets write of. This is Jesus coming in the fulfillment of all the Jewish dreams, the warrior Messiah who comes to wage war. When Jesus walked on earth, they didn't recognize him as the Messiah. They didn't recognize him in the flesh because the Jews were looking for a warrior. And, and now, now they've got that warrior. But it's only here after they've missed all that Christ has brought to them. He, Jesus walking there on the roads of, of Israel was the one who, who didn't attack the Romans. He healed the centurion slave. He, he praised the centurion, the officer, for his, his faith. Greater faith, Jesus said, than in all of Israel. He advocated paying the Roman tax. Give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, he says in Matthew 22. And when he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem... It was not on a great white war horse. I'm sorry? Beth McCool joined you. Beth McCool and Sam. Lamb. That's it. Let's time to take up an offering. All right. Okay. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. So sorry. Uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, recognize him as, as, as the one they were looking for because he seemed so just dadgum friendly with the Romans. No, we want the warrior who's going to bring all of this about. And when he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, it wasn't on a great white charger. It was on a donkey. When the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, he did not come as the conqueror that they all were looking for, but as the one who takes away the sins of the world. Well, in the Apocrypha, uh, during that time in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, roughly a 300-year period, there was a lot of things that were written that uh, weren't part of the Old Testament, weren't part of the New Testament. These are called apocryphal books. And one of them was called the Psalms of Solomon. And the Psalms of Solomon uh, were written during a time when Israel was perpetually fighting for their freedom. Uh, they had uh, uh, come home from, from Babylon because the Persians had conquered uh, the Babylonians and, and set them free, but then here come the Greeks, and then the Greeks uh, split up, and, and Alexander the Great dies, and his generals take over, and they're not as gracious as Alexander. And, and so uh, you've got all kinds of, of problems with uh, different conquerors coming in. And, and then once the Greeks are gone, then the Romans are, are coming. And there was just constant war and constant battle. And, and so they were, they were looking for that Messiah uh, who would come and smash all of their enemies. Why would God not defend us? Why would God not protect us like he did against the Egyptians? And, 
And so they would look for that time. And so in, in, um, in the Psalms of Solomon, in the 17th Psalm, it says, Behold, O Lord, raise up to them their king, the son of David, at a time in which thou seest, O God, that he may reign over Israel thy servant and gird him with strength that he may shatter unrighteous rulers, that he may purge Jerusalem from nations that trample her down to destruction. Wisely and righteously he shall thrust out sinners from the inheritance. He shall destroy the pride of the sinner as a potter's vessel. With a rod of iron he shall break into pieces all their substance. He shall destroy the godless nations with the words of his mouth. At his rebuke nations shall flee from him. And he shall reprove sinners for the thoughts of their hearts. Well, that's charming, isn't it? This is, this is who they were looking for. A carpenter's son from Nazareth? No, they didn't understand. The one who would praise the centurion for his faith? No. The one who would eat and drink with sinners, who would, who would go up to, to Tyre and Sidon and Phoenicia and associate with Gentiles. I mean, you know, just this can't be the Messiah, they, they thought to themselves. But he was. And they missed it. And it was all right there in the Old Testament. Time and time again, the Old Testament kept saying, this is who the Messiah is. The, the book of Isaiah has it all over it. And they missed it. But here he comes now, at the end, out of heaven, riding a white horse. That was always a symbol of triumph. A white charger, a Roman General would always ride a, a white horse like that when on parade, celebrating his, his triumphs. And it says that he is faithful and true. Well, the word faithful in Greek is, is the word pistos, uh, meaning to be absolutely, absolutely trusted. Absolutely trusted. Uh, the word for true that's in Greek here. Uh, because the Greeks had multiple words for our single English words. Uh, Athenos, Athenos, Alephenos, Alephenos. And it means one who brings truth without ever any falsehood. But it also means genuine, as in real and authentic, the real deal. So in Jesus Christ, we meet reality. We meet reality. In Isaiah 11... We are, we are told that the chosen one of God is the one who will judge with righteousness, not vengeance, not an elevated sense of morality, but, but righteousness. Uh, hello to Nancy up, up in North Carolina. It's good to, good to connect with you too. I'm glad you're here. And so in verse 11, heaven opens up for John. And he sees a white horse, and he who is on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges, and he wages war. He wages war. Verse 12 says, His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Which no one knows except himself. His eyes are a flame of fire. Repeatedly, Jesus is described as, as having eyes like fire. Uh, we saw it in the very first chapter in Revelation 1.14. We saw it in chapter 2 in Revelation 2.18. And it represents his all-consuming power. Uh, you know, fire consumes everything, particularly in the ancient world. Once a fire started... It wasn't going to stop until it, it, it wore itself out. It was going to consume everything in front of it. And so this eye of, of fire that Jesus comes, representing his all-consuming fire. He comes wearing many diadems, the New American Standard says. Well, the Greek word for royal crown is diadema. It's a royal crown as opposed to a crown you might wear as a... Uh, uh, an athletic champion. They didn't get a gold medal. They got a, a crown, a, a crown of, of, of uh, flowers or a crown of, of olive branches. Uh, it was a, you know, an athletic crown 
But here, no, this is a diadema. This is a royal crown, and he's wearing many of them to show that he is Lord over every kingdom, every nation on the earth. He's Lord of Rome. He's Lord of India. He's Lord of Africa, China, the whole world. Christ is Lord of all, and so he wears all of these. But now we come to that mystery name. He has a name written on him, which no one knows but himself. So I'm glad you all tuned in tonight to find out what it is. Now, uh, if I would tell you, it wouldn't be much of a mystery. But here's three thoughts. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 tells us that God has given a name to the victorious and resurrected Jesus that is a name above all names. But it doesn't tell us what the name is. A name above all names that God has given the risen Christ. Surely this must have been the unknown name and surely this name must include the word Lord because that's what Paul says in Philippians, that, you know, that he is the Lord. And so, you know, that's, that's the name, but we don't know what that name is. Second, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it tells us that when we see Jesus face to face, we will know, we will know in heaven things that we cannot possibly know here on earth. Um, you know, and that's, that's the deal. There are so many questions we have here on earth. Lord, why? Why did this happen? And why not that? And, and Lord, I don't understand. And, and it's at that point that we're finally getting to where we need to be. Yeah, that's it. That's right. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so there will be so much that we're going to be able to see in heaven. So many things we're going to know in heaven. And in heaven, when we see Jesus face to face, we'll know his name. We'll know. Um, my friend in Athens, Ron, he, uh, he was talking about uh, a dear saint who we love dearly, who had gone to be with the Lord. And, and everybody kept saying, oh, what a great reunion, you know. Uh, she's going to see her mama and she's going to see her daddy. And it's a it's a great and wonderful thing. And, and Ron said, yeah, you know, it, it is. All of that is. But the best thing, the thing, is that she'll get to see Jesus. She closed her eyes here on earth and woke up in heaven. And the first face she saw was Jesus. And she knew his name. And he knew hers. The Jews held that the name of God was so holy that it could not be spoken or even truly known. And that only in heaven could you know the name of God. Only in heaven could the name of God be known and spoken. So number one, in Philippians, uh, we're told that God has given Jesus a name that is above all names. Two, uh, there are things here on earth that we will never know, that we will only know when we see Jesus. And third, there was the idea that if you knew the name of a supernatural being, you may have power over it. Uh, you see this in the story of the Gerasene demoniac in Mark chapter 5. In verse 9, Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the demoniac responds, you know, my name is Legion, for we are many. And at that point, Jesus was able to direct the demons out of the man and into the herd of swine. What is your name? Uh, having that power, uh, you know, knowing the name gives you an advantage. When Jacob, for instance, in Genesis 32, wrestled with the angel, he asked the angel, what is your name? And the angel refused to answer him. He would not tell him. And so there, there is that idea. And, and it's been down through the ages. So if you think about uh, your, uh, your nursery rhymes, wasn't that the deal with Rumpelstiltskin? Uh, no one had any power over him unless they could guess his name. And so it's the same kind of idea here. Jesus has a power that no one will ever be able to circumvent. Uh, no one will ever be able to overcome. They don't know his name. 
He has a name that only God knows. He has a name that only those in heaven know. Finally, here in, in verse 12, we need to remember that mystery has always surrounded Christ. And we struggle with that. There are pastors who don't even like to talk about the mystery of Christ as they're talking with, with new believers. But you have to deal with, with questions for people. You need to be honest. There's a mystery about Christ. How was he pre-existent? Uh, good point. Uh, Jenny just said it was the same with Beetlejuice. You, if you could say his name three times, you, you had power over it. Good point. Didn't think of Beetlejuice. Uh, but, uh, you know, the mystery of Jesus, how was he pre-existent? Well, we don't really know. We can't really explain it. Um, uh, we, can, we can take shots at it to help people understand the Trinity, but they, they all fail. Um, when I remember when I was a kid, uh, uh, somebody said, well, you know, it's like uh, uh, H2O. It can be uh, ice, it can be uh, uh, steam, and it can be water, but it's all H2O. Well, that's true, but that's not quite the same as the Trinity of God. Um, uh, where the Father is, is greater than the Son and the Holy Spirit follows direction of both. It's not quite the same. And so there's a mystery about it. Uh, how was he conceived? How did that happen? There, there are pastors who don't even like to preach that because uh, it's, it's too hard for people to wrap their brain around. But why not just tell the truth? Trust God with the truth and that his Holy Spirit will speak to them to help them be able to accept it. Um, what happened to Jesus physically after the resurrection? Physically after the resurrection. Uh, he comes to the 12. He shows Thomas his wounds. Uh, you know, he's hungry. He wants to eat. Uh, yet he could appear and, and disappear like he did with the, the people on, on the road to Emmaus. And they're in the house with them, with, with the disciples where he was and then he wasn't. Um, so there's a mystery about Jesus that we'll never be able to fully explain. And in heaven, he was given a new name that we will never know until we see him face to face. All right, we're only going to get to verse 13. Uh, we've been doing pretty good uh, 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 going through the chapters until we hit chapter 19. But chapter 19 is huge. It's, it's pivotal. And 13 is, is big. How do you describe the risen Christ there on his white horse? He is clothed, verse 13 says, he is clothed with a robe dripped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. A robe dripped in blood. Not the typical image one gets when... Um, the risen Lord is, is thought of. When we think about Jesus, uh, we don't think about him being on a white charger, a war horse, uh, with a robe dripped in blood. No. Um, but this is not his blood. This is not the blood of the Lamb, but the blood of the enemies of God. Uh, here, Jesus is not the slain. He is the slayer. He is coming to wage war. He is coming to crush those who have chosen evil and not good. Those who have chosen Satan and not the Father. Here Jesus is not the slain, but the slayer. Again, the image comes from Scripture. It's, it's Isaiah chapter 63, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah chapter 63 Verses 1 through 6, it, re, it is referring to God's vengeance on Edom and all the nations. Who is this, says Isaiah 63, who comes from Edom with garments glowing of colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speaks in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine, the wine trough alone, God says. 
and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained with all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I looked, and there was no one to help, and I was astonished. There was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation with me, and my wrath upheld me. And I trod down the peoples in my anger, and I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their blood on the earth. No, those are not the images that we normally think of when we think of, of Jesus, when we think of our Father in heaven. But those are the images from his word. They've always been there. We just choose to ignore them. And it says that he is the word of God. While these are the same words that are used in the beginning of John's gospel, they mean something very different here. To the mind of the Jews, words were not mere sounds for communication. Words were alive. Words did things. Um, a single word could be as binding as steel. You see this in uh, the story of, of Jacob and Esau and their, their father Isaac. Uh, Jacob fools his blind father into giving him his brother's inheritance. And when his brother finds it out, he confronts his father and says, Whoa, 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 why did you give my brother my inheritance? And his father says, Well, it's done. I'm sorry. I've spoken the word. And the word can't be broken. Um, words did things. They could be as binding as, as steel and in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that a single word may condemn you to hell. In Matthew 5, 22, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Words do things. Uh, the saying that children have that sticks and stones might break their bones, but words can never harm them. Boy, that's just not true. It's, it's not true. Words are powerful. And so here comes the word of God. Again, in that apocryphal book, The Wisdom of Solomon, it is the word of God that is the instrument of death during the plagues of Egypt as it recounts the story of, of the death angel coming to, to slay all of the Egyptian firstborn, in the, in the Psalms of Solomon, there in that apocryphal book, they refer to the angel of death as the word of God. In Jeremiah 23, 29, God asks, Is not my word like fire and like a hammer which shatters rock? Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so here, as we come into the home stretch of the book of Revelation, as we come into chapter 19, those who have chosen poorly are, are getting the, the results of their choice. Uh, I love that third Indiana Jones movie where they're looking for the Holy Grail. And Indiana shows a great amount of faith that his father's very proud of when he finds it. But so do the bad guys. The bad guys follow him in. And all of these cups, these grails, these cups of Christ are there. And, and so the old ancient knight guarding the grail says, well, you must choose. And so he picks out the cup of the king of kings, a cup with gold and jewels, and he drinks of it. And he dissolves rather horribly. And the old knight says, he chose poorly. Well, that's, the, that's the deal. God always gives us a choice. And he lays it out very clearly for us. There are two paths. The broad one that is wide and smooth and easy that so many choose. But it is the path of destruction. The narrow path, the hard path, the path that few choose. This is the path to salvation. 
This is the path of life. And so those who have chosen poorly now face the risen Christ who comes just as the Jews always expected, but he's coming for them. He's coming for the ones who chose poorly, Jew and Gentile alike. He's coming to destroy them. And his robe is dripped in blood. And so as we finish up those three little verses that are so packed with so much, how have we chosen? Have we chosen well or have we chosen poorly? It's all up to us. He doesn't make us follow him. He doesn't make us love him. He doesn't make us believe. He lays it out there for us to choose, to leave everything behind, pick up our cross and follow him. So thanks for being a part of our Bible study tonight. We're going to stop there at the end of, of uh, verse 13. Uh, but we are going to uh, not be uh, finished. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to have some prayer time. Jenny did ask a very crucial question. Yes, it is the Ark of the Covenant there in Area 51, uh, but uh, I, I don't know that uh, you know we're going to be able to get into it anytime soon. So thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, Sunday, uh, our worship service is going to be at 10:30. Uh, it will be on uh, Facebook again, just like last time. Uh, it'll also be on YouTube just like last time. You may have an easier time on YouTube than on Facebook. Um, every church on the East Coast uh, logged on at 11 o'clock and crashed YouTube. Uh, no, so if, Facebook. if crashed, Facebook. Uh, crashed Facebook, not YouTube. YouTube is fine. Every church in America logged on at 11 o'clock Sunday morning and crashed Facebook. So if you want to know finally who's graded in Facebook, it's not the Russians, it's the church. So, uh, so we're going to try to uh, be done by 11 o'clock uh, uh, between 10.30 and 11, and we look forward to it. Um, uh, uh, we've got some very special uh, folks from our own Sweetwater family who are going to be doing music, and it's going to be a good time. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, John and Beth and Wendy and, and Mabel. Thank you all for uh, uh, being here with us. Isn't technology wonderful? Yeah, when it works. And uh, we actually didn't get it to work till about uh, 30 seconds before we were starting. Shelby, we are praying for uh, Shelby... Shelby, thank you for logging in. We're praying for you and, and your sweet husband, and we just love you guys. Sherry, thank you for being here. God bless. Uh, Marianne, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Angela, yeah, awesome. And Nathan. Uh, and, um, and Nathan, thank you guys. Cheryl, wow, look at all you, all, all the way up in West Virginia. Who knew that the internet went to West Virginia? So, uh, uh, so we're glad you all are here. God bless. Stay in touch. Uh, let yes. us know how we can pray for you. Let us know how we can help. And let us know how we can help. And my director says she loves you very much. All right. God bless you all. We're signing off. And uh, have a great Wednesday night. And we will be back on YouTube and here on Facebook Sunday morning at 1030. God bless.